Welcome to the last part of Series 17. We are excited for you to hear our discussion about our adorable characters. But first, announcements. One Shot Network boss, published author TV's James D'Amato, has written another <laughs> book. It's called The Ultimate RPG Gameplay Guide, and it is up for pre-order on Amazon now. His birthday was just a few days ago, so if you forgot to get him something, pre-ordering mm -hmm. his book would make a great gift. We will put a link to it in our show notes. Yeah. And we will still be at Gen Con. That hasn't changed within the last week. So you can check out our events either by looking at our pinned tweet or by searching for the One Shot Podcast Network on our Gen Con site or checking our show notes. Uh, we hope to see all of you there. I'm really looking forward to seeing some people. I think it'll be a lot of fun. Yeah, there's there's some people that have been on my I need to meet this person so bad list for a long time that will be at Gen Con and I cannot wait to meet all of them. Yeah, it'll be a lot of fun. You're going to have so much fun. Mm -hmm. You're going to be so overwhelmed. <laughs> I know. <laughs> oh, it's a lot, oh, but it's a good time. I'm trying to keep my schedule like clear enough, but it's uh it's I'm on more things than I thought I was going to be on, so mm -hmm. it's interesting. Mhm. Mm um uh, it's time for a review. Review. We, we only have two left, uh, which means you guys, we have not gotten any in a while, so probably get on that. Yes, um, please. I know that we haven't read them in a while either, so that's also partly on us. But um, <laughs> you know what? You do better. We'll do better. We'll hold each other accountable. Uh, I think it'll be good for everybody. It's, mm -hmm. it's teamwork. This review is from, I'm going to say this wrong and I'm so sorry. Hurley? Hurley? I don't know. I recognize the name from Twitter. Thank you for the review. I'm sorry. I don't know how to say it. I can only read it. <laughs> <laughs> this review is titled, The Nicest Show I Listen To. Character Creation Cast is both extremely chill and listenable and full of useful insight into games and the character creation process. Amelia and Ryan managed to wrangle some of the most interesting guests into deep, meaningful discussions on the games they are passionate about. The process of making characters and their advice on certain aspects of playing RPGs are some of the most useful and actionable advice I've ever heard for players. I really love this show. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. That was a really nice review. And I'm glad that you find our advice actionable. I feel like that's really important. I want it to be stuff mm -hmm. that people can use, you know, like you can talk about stuff, but some people are like, that doesn't apply to my game. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm glad. I'm glad to hear that. Thank you very much. Yeah. Well, with all of that out of the way, let's get on with the show. To our discussion episode. Last time we created a group of characters for Mouse Guard. This episode, we'll be discussing the character creation process. We are very excited to welcome back Megan and Charlotte of the Tabletop Potluck podcast. Do you want to go ahead and introduce yourselves again for everyone at home and tell us a little bit about the characters you made? Uh, Megan, I don't know if you want to go first. Sure. My name is Megan. As said, I'm part of the Tabletop Potluck podcast. You can find me online at tabletop underscore Megan. That's Twitter and Instagram. And last time I made a mouse who's <laughs> a little chubby brown mouse from Ivydale. And he's a guard mouse and mostly a baker. And his name's Duncan and he's great. <laughs> <laughs> Charlotte, what about you? Yes. Uh, as stated, I am Charlotte from Tabletop Potluck. You can find me on Twitter at the Cornbreb with a B. And I made Wilmot the patrol leader, kind of the most senior member of our little mouse guard patrol. A uh, slightly grizzled veteran has seen a couple of scrapes in her day and is a hunter as well. Mm -hmm. And Amelia, why don't you tell us about your character? Um, I made Magdalena who is a sweet, tiny baby mouse. Um, <laughs> Magdalena is still a tender paw and is under the tutelage of Wilmot. Man, Magdalena's just the best. 
just like the sweetest little mouse and just just doing her best, you know? She's just, just doing a little her best. baby. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And what about you, Ryan? Um, I made a lovely little boy named Tander. Um, he's got black fur and little white booty feet. Aww. Um, just adorable. And he is a pathfinder for the mouse guard, trying to find the best paths to various safe places. Um, and also half sibling of Wilmot. Oh, that's right. You have your, yes. Yes, your family story. I love it. We've, we've got a fun little uh, happy family. We do indeed. Mm-hmm. Oh, they're all so cute and I love them. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Uh, so let's go ahead and dive right into a segment we are calling D20 for your thoughts. D20 for your thoughts. In this segment, we want to talk to our guests about their thoughts on the character creation process and how it feels in this system compared to others that they've played. First, though, we always ask how you got into role playing games. How did you end up here? Uh, Well, for me, it's hard to say because I feel like I've always been at least cognizant of TTRPGs. Uh, My younger brother has always been just a huge nerd. We're a family of nerds. Um, So I remember (laughs) learning a lot about uh, Dungeons and Dragons from him. Um, And then uh, the first time I played, I think I was in college. It was New Year's Eve. I played an elven ranger. It was fourth edition and I hugged a dragon. Uh, Nice. (laughs) And then it just kind of snowballed out of control from there. Like it does. <laughs> well, you it can't does. really go higher than hugging dragons. I know. It was like, well, where do I go from here? And the answer was other TTRPGs. So uh-huh. uh, I got into actual play podcasts just kind of by happenstance. And uh, that really helped me learn other systems besides D&D. And I just have a lot of gosh darn fun playing them. They're pretty great, huh? They are. <laughs> Those tabletop games, what good fun. Oh, man. Ah, jeez. <laughs> uh, <laughs> what about you, Megan? So one of the other members of our podcast, Marquez, was actually my roommate in college. So he introduced me also to D&D first. Uh, seems to be, you know, the one everyone knows about first. <laughs> yeah, the gateway drug. Yeah, and uh, so we started with a group of people that we were doing Shakespeare with, and I basically played a little halfling bard who was basically an even sadder Frodo Baggins. Oh, no. so, <laughs> even oh, sadder. I've gotten a lot happier <laughs> since then. <laughs> Marquez was also my first DM. He ran the game where I hugged a dragon, so. Nice. <laughs> Awesome. Well, then can you tell us about your personal process for picking and creating characters in any role-playing game? Usually, I think I actually start with characters' flaws first, because I think that's the most interesting thing. So, like, with Mouse Guard, I was like, okay, so I want to play a garden mouse. What's his flaw? Well, he doesn't really (laughs) care about fighting or doing it. He just wants to bake. (laughs) Like, Mm -hmm. it's not really great for the system. So I'll say it's a flaw. That's And, yeah, so I'll do stuff like that. And I try to make them different. And I'll usually be like, all right, last five characters I made. What haven't I done in those last five? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah. And go from there for creating the rest of them, like their class and skills and things. Yeah, that makes sense. Charlotte, how about yourself? Uh, for me, honestly, I normally start with a goof or a joke. <laughs> so I'll have this idea. That it, for instance, one of the first D&D characters I made, um, it was like the height of the jorts joke era. So oh. I made her main thing was Jarmer or Jean Armor. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um. Uh, so it started out as a total joke, right? But then the nice thing about when you start with a joke is that you can kind of reverse engineer a serious character out of it if you want to. <laughs> uh, so it ended up being like a very interesting character to play with a lot more depth than just like, lol, she wears <laughs> jean armor. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the denim is Tron with this one. <laughs> 
you find that there's like a certain type of character that you like to play, like a certain kind of class? Or I know, Megan, you said you kind of change it up based on what you played previously. Does that like, how, how does that feel? Because I'm one of those people that like, I don't like to play fighters or barbarians or things like that. Like I always want to go with the, the face of a party or like Mm. the magic user. I don't find a ton of fun in like playing fighters. So I don't know how that feels for you. Like, do you have preferences or? I definitely, I enjoy playing tanks a lot. Uh, I I like (laughs) hitting things very hard (laughs) as Megan is very aware of this fact. (laughs) <laughs> um, but I'd say I have kind of two character archetypes that I fall back on, which is a big buff lady or just a total jerk of a tiny man. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. So you can play super buff lady or Napoleon. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> uh. <laughs> I almost never play face characters because trying to be charismatic makes me nervous. <laughs> That's fair. Mm-hmm. I do kind of fall into the opposite problem. I like playing <laughs> characters that are uh, kind of more charisma based or in- intelligent. Mm-hmm. So when mm-hmm. I'm like, I'm playing a brute, I'm like, yes, but how does this make you feel? I'm like, <laughs> they shouldn't ask that. They wouldn't do that. <laughs> Hold on, pause. <laughs> um, but I kind of see myself falling into like the curious researcher type a lot on tabletop potluck I just kind of do it and I'm like (laughs) oh well they're fun and I also make characters that tend to deal very heavily in truth versus lies yes (laughs) (laughs) yeah I'm always interested because like what When we started making this podcast, I think it became clear pretty quickly that Ryan and I tended to fall into pretty standard tropes. Um, (laughs) And so it's always been interesting to me to like for people who can play kind of whatever is, I don't know, it's fascinating to me because I cannot. (laughs) It's totally okay to have a type. You know, people are like, oh, I want to be more versatile. I'm like, have fun. Do whatever you want to do. No right. pressure. And that's the thing is that I'm one of those people that tends to talk a lot, too. So if I pick a character type that is meant to do that, it's less disruptive at the table, too. And so, like, playing into those things that are my personal strengths always feels better than trying to play something that I either am not interested in or um, doesn't really fit with my own personality because I'm not good at it and that's not to say that like i I shouldn't maybe practice stretching those muscles a little bit but yeah ultimately we're here to have fun and if that kind of character type isn't super exciting for you then like don't do that Mm -hmm. but okay i know that none of those questions were on our our sheet but i was just interested (laughs) it's a natural (laughs) flow of an interview it's good interview questions I want to ask, how do you think character creation in this game stacks up against other games that you've played I really like it. Like I mentioned in the actual character creation bit, um, I just really love a game that makes you make your backstory Mm -hmm. and make some depth to your character and know where they come from and know kind of where they're going or where they want to go. And that's exactly what Mouse Guard does. You can't really sit in a game without knowing some of that. And Mm -hmm. I appreciate that for building blocks for making sure my character isn't just a cardboard cutout. Yeah. Yeah. And they even, skills are one of the last things that you assign in character creation, too. So it's very hard to try and min max in this game because if you pick things in your backstory just by what you think is interesting, then, you know, the skills that correlate aren't always going to be like the most quote optimized unquote. Uh, which I think is really cool because it's more fun that way for me, at least to have a more narrative focus than uh, an optimized focus. I think that coming up with the story for your character is one of the harder parts for people too. I mean, some people go in and are like, I have this brilliant idea right away. And then now I have to look up the stats, but I think that coming up with a solid character arc and getting a grasp on who your character is, is one of the harder parts of character creation like plugging in numbers isn't that tough you know so i think systems that kind of help you build that story as part of the character creation process leave you in a better place to start the game because you're not coming in like okay i have these block of numbers and now that we're sitting down at the table i have to start to interpret them 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, square one is already done. Yeah. yeah. Not to name drop D&D again, but <laughs> for Dungeons & Dragons, uh, I remember in his very first game, my boyfriend wrote a 32-page backstory for his character. Mm-hmm. And it made me really sad because that didn't affect his character at all. Like, it, mm-hmm. could, it affected his role-playing, but unless he was given an opportunity to role-play, you couldn't see it on his sheet. Mm-hmm. You couldn't tell it through his skills or any sort of anything that right. was there. You'd only know if you said, hey, what's your backstory? And then he'd email you the PDF. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. And I think that that's disappointing because I think that you... One of the things that I really like about RPGs is that it's this shared experience of telling this story. And so you don't really walk away with very much in the way of like tangibles, except your character sheet. And so if your character sheet doesn't help tell that story, you've kind of walked away with, I don't want to say nothing because you have that experience, but physically you've walked away with nothing. And so I like when it's all kind of incorporated in there so you can get Mm -hmm. a real sense of what that is without it being like, oh yeah, also I had this thing that I really wanted to do or tried to do or whatever, and there's no like record of it. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, the story first in this game is really interesting, especially compared to something like D&D, where it's it's literally, okay, what, what race and class am I going to be? And that pretty much determines everything that I'm going to be doing in this game. Whereas this game, it's, I'm a mouse. Okay. What race am I? Mouse. Yep. Mouse. <laughs> yep. You're a mouse. And you're what part, of the, part of the mouse guard. The guard. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Let's just see how, how much of a veteran of the mouse guard you are and go from there. And that even that choice, that, that initial choice, is a story choice. It tells you a whole ton. Yeah, and it's really interesting because you'd think that that would make it so there would be less of a variety of characters. But Mm -hmm. I've seen such a variety in Mouse Guard characters because, like, it's like with people, your job doesn't determine your personality and Mm -hmm. who you are. Yes. So the fact that they all share the same job in no way means that they're clones of each other. Yeah, that's super interesting. I hadn't really thought about it that way. But yeah, when you you look at something, again, sorry, D&D. Uh, actually, not sorry. But when you look at something like that, that it's like, okay, this is, you know, like your class is essentially what you do. And yeah, not all barbarians are going to be the same. And you can role play them differently and you can kind mm-hmm. of choose some of your stats a little bit differently. But in order to be able to be effective in any way, shape or form, you can't. Um, and yeah, that's people are so different that it's I like when games encourage you to be that sort of individual in that way and i like games that don't require or encourage min maxing too Mm -hmm. i think i mean and i think for some people that is really fun to like find the optimal way to do things it's like a like unlocking a puzzle um but i think it also depends on what you come to the table for and for me Mm -hmm. as a more narrative player this kind of character creation this kind of storytelling is um is preferred let's say so, how do the mechanics of character creation reinforce the feel of Mouse Guard? I'm trying to think of things to add that we yeah. didn't kind of just cover in the last no. question. Yeah, I mean, and I think that we we did cover a lot of it. I get the sense, mm-hmm. like, obviously, I haven't played this game, so all I can tell you is what I've experienced through character creation. But I get the sense that it is very much about storytelling and about interpersonal relationships Mm -hmm. because so many of the skills that you get and so much of character creation is based around your relationships with other people like you get Mm -hmm. skills based on what your parents do and you know those kinds of things so my understanding of it is that you're going to be telling a shared story and that a lot of it is going to be based off of those interpersonal relationships Mm -hmm. yeah definitely i feel like sometimes with games the character creation process is almost kind of entirely divorced from the rest of the game. It feels like two completely different things. Mm -hmm. Um, For Mouse Guard, I feel like it's really well integrated and it flows very naturally into an actual session of play. Mm -hmm. The fact that that some of character sheets that you can find out there for Mouse Guard have sections for your team 
or people you meet and form connections with, I think says a lot about how people view the game and mm -hmm. what they take out of it, which is that it's about an, it's a narrative about making connections across this really big, really small world. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I think that that kind of answers our next question too, which is uh, how does the process of going through character creation set your expectations for what the game is going to be? And I think, you know, like I said, from what I can tell, it's going to be about relationships and things like that. Mm -hmm. And so I think that this game does a really good job of that. Because you're right, there are a lot of games where it feels like a mini game or like mm -hmm. its own separate activity. And um, I think that this one flows really well into starting the game. I think by the time you've finished character creation, you've got some group cohesion. You've got, you know, like you're ready to jump right in. Mm hmm. And you've got a ton of story points for the Game Master as well. Absolutely. Like, here's some NPCs that I'm friendly with. Here's some NPCs that I'm not friendly with. Yes. Here's some NPCs you can hurt me with. Yeah. Here's, yes. my, here's my parents. I've got my parents on my character sheet. That, yeah, the options for a cool. GM is pretty insane, I yeah. think. Yeah, I think you've I think... got all kinds of strings to pull right there just by yeah. finishing that, like, I don't know how many questions it was, like 17 or 18. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think the only thing that character creation doesn't super set up is combat. Mm -hmm. Because it's kind of a wayside thing, but games do typically include combat. Mm -hmm. It is. It does have that element. It's not like it's a game that doesn't have it. Mm -hmm. They say when you go out, expect to fight. Mm-hmm. But it's really easy to make a character and be like, oh, I have no skills in fighting. Does uh -huh. anyone? Did anyone remember <laughs> no? that? No? <laughs> okay. to fight something? Right? That, yep. like, technically we're kind of in, like, a little army. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like, oh, no, I guess we're all, uh, we all have desk jobs. And mm -hmm. we just forgot. <laughs> yeah, there, there's a couple <laughs> little sections. We can still do it. There's a couple little sections in there that kind of hint towards it. Um, I know when you're going through the, the part where it's asking you about your mouse nature. Um, mm -hmm. and talking about, hey, are you afraid of these wolves and, and yeah. those big giant things that are going to definitely eat you if they find you? It's like, remember, these might come up, guys. Uh -huh. And you're like, oh, maybe I should go back and switch something. Yeah. <laughs> and I think yeah. only my the, parent the... was a fighter. <laughs> <laughs> I think two out of the four of us, half of us said we'd stay and fight. So uh -huh. I guess it's just a two-on, you know, giant animal fight. I'm just a cartographer. <laughs> I think, though, that there aren't many games that the character creation sort of sets you up for, like, what combat will be. I mean, I guess that there are games where, like, you know, you're you're choosing your weapons and you're, like, statting those things out. So I guess the, the expectation yeah. mm -hmm. that's going to come up is clearer, but I don't know that it necessarily sets you up for, like, the expectation of what it's going to be like, if that mm -hmm. makes sense. The thing is, I think most systems, the... Almost the entirety of character creation is combat oriented. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's saying, what are your numbers going to be when you're rolling to fight something? Yep. What are you wearing to fight someone? Right. What are your skills in fighting? Mm -hmm. What spells do you have to hurt someone? Yeah. While Mouse Guard has it as a background thing, which is really different from like D&D &D Pathfinder. A lot more of the... Considering how crunchy this game actually kind of ends up being, surprisingly... Uh, most crunchy games are much more combat focused. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it seems like combat and like social and utility skills have an equal weight in this mm -hmm. sort of system when you're creating your character. Most definitely. Which I, I guess that that kind of sets you up for what type of game it's going to be because it's going to be social, utility, and combat probably in equal measures for the most yeah. part. There's an entire section of the game, because there's rounds, there's the player's rounds and there's the GM's round, is, is kind of how it's broken up. I might be getting wording of it mixed up, mm -hmm. but, um, so like one of them, so you'll go in the round that's usually like combat, travel, fighting the weather, etc. And then you go into a round where it's, you're in the town, what research are you going to do? Who, are you, who do you have to meet up with? How are you going to heal? How are you going to rest? How are you going to feel good? Mm -hmm. And so every session is supposed to have both of those covered. So 
What do you think is the biggest flaw of character creation in this system? That's a good question, because there's so much I like about it. I know, right? <laughs> Honestly, I just feel like I'd appreciate if they were like, remember, though, at least one person should probably be able to fight. <laughs> mm-hmm. Even though you don't want to like tell someone that that's they have to make that character, because it's kind of like the old trope of like, well, we need at least one healer. And mm-hmm. it's like, no, you don't. You can survive. Mm-hmm. But also, it's kind of rough if you don't have a fighter. Yeah. And then like a rattlesnake shows up Mm -hmm. (laughs) yeah yeah i mean i think that there are lots of games where party balance is super imperative and you can't really function without that and there are also plenty of games where it is sort of up to the gm to kind of balance those things but it does seem like this game from the way you're describing it is like uh, you know like you can get by but having at least a little bit of balance is going to make the game feel better because I think nobody likes to lose, you know, I mm-hmm. mean, like you can't really lose at RPGs, but nobody likes to fail. It's not exciting to continually do that over and over again. Like you want to have some successes. And if the game is built to have some of those combats in there, if that's an integral part of it, then, you know, having somebody who can fight becomes an integral part of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, it seems like definitely something that uh, a session zero where you're doing all these characters together comes into play very well because oh, yeah. when you're creating people, when you're creating your little mice, um, you can say, hey, you know, does anybody have fighting skills? Especially if you've played the game previously. Mm-hmm. Just to make sure that somebody's competent, if not more than one person. Well, and that's, I know why when we when we did our session zero discussion too, one of the the key things that I felt was really important was having like a quick elevator pitch for Mm -hmm. what the game is going to be so that you're not ending up with somebody who's like, Oh, I'm really great at doing, you know, uh, flower arranging. And, you know, we're like in the middle of a desert. That's no fun. (laughs) Nobody wants to play that kind of game. So having a quick (laughs) elevator pitch that says like, yes, combat's going to come up. And then people can make that decision from there whether they feel that's important, you know? Mm-hmm. Here, I thought that your answer, Amelia, was going to be, you have to make up so many names. <laughs> <laughs> that is a little bit rough, but the ga- the book does give you some options. So that's at true. least I, you know, I appreciate that they've got my back there and at least gives you um, like some ground to kind of say, okay, this is the tone of the names in this game too. Mm-hmm. Um, because sometimes I just yeah, don't just even like know where Steve. to start. Yeah. Yeah, this is Steve. This is Bob. This is Joe. This is Mary. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, that's boring. I mean, you could do that if you want, I guess. My sister's name is Mary. Um, but, you know, that's because she's the fourth child and they were running out of names. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to talk a little bit about the differences between playing an animal and playing a person. Do you think that there are certain challenges? Are there certain benefits? This is not something that I've really done before. I've always played people, like humans or elves or something like that. Uh, humanoid. I guess with the, expe- the exception of like Descent to Midnight, where you play a fish, <laughs> some kind of fish thing. Um, Those are aliens, not animals. Right. Uh, very important <laughs> distinction. It uh-huh. is. It is. Uh, I think what... I'm trying to find a good way to phrase this i think mouse guard is interesting in that it has the nature skill which is literally how much of a mouse are you Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it can vary based on what character you're playing so you can you can play a very person-like mouse or a very mouse-like mouse uh which i feel like in other games even if you are playing a more animal type it's always just very anthropomorphic Mm -hmm. Uh, with this i think you have a little bit more option to play someone who's a little bit more mousy forgive the pun (laughs) (laughs) i think it's a bigger thing for gms the difference i think is a lot bigger because you need to think or like if you're playing more of a tactician role on the team those are the two people who are most affected by the fact that you're playing mice instead of humanoids Mm -hmm. because scale is really important and constant everyday threats that can show up out of nowhere that seem as mundane to humans as rain. Mm-hmm. 
mm-hmm. if you're in an open field in like a D and D or something, the worst that that could be is if you're like, well, we're in dragon territory, so maybe there's a dragon. But you could be in a field just outside of your town and be like, there are probably hawks right now in mm-hmm. the sky above me that I don't see because they're just out of my view and they're good at keeping out of my sight. Mm-hmm. And just having to keep those little things in your head, like anything can be, can be fatal. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Adjusting that frame of reference is, I think would be uniquely challenging Mm -hmm. because it's not the same as just like playing in an alien world where you have to, you know, like there are these threats that are completely different than anything that we face regularly. Mm -hmm. It's, it's regular things that we don't think of as threatening, right? Rather than transferring, you know, like monsters or something like that. And you say, okay, even in this world, they look different but it's the same basic concept of some kind of horror or something like that whereas this is like no these are everyday things that are terrifying now Mm -hmm. it's all very grounded that's Mm -hmm. for sure yeah i i was trying to picture what it would be like to play it in this game and go to an actual human city and try to survive and that just sounds like the most terrifying experience yeah because humans have cats, we uh-huh. have dogs too, yep. and yep. you know humans who don't like rodents, and they get cats and dogs to get rid of them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's hard out there for a mouse. It is. Oh, uh-huh. our sweet baby mice don't deserve that. No. Oh. <laughs> Look, Dad, this mouse has a cape. <laughs> <laughs> a pretty cool shield. And now you're in a cage for the rest of your life. Oh. Aww. Mine doesn't even have a cloak. <laughs> yeah, you'll probably just get the cat then. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no cloak, cat for you. Oh, that's so sad. <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, so let's discuss our group's cohesion. Uh, how does our current group gel mechanically? And would we feel that this group would fare well in a typical session in this game well i mean i know we were just talking about people having skills to fight and things like that i'm Mm -hmm. trying to see like i'm a sweet baby mouse i can't do much i've got a three in fight i have Uh, a four in fight i got nothing nothing i got a two that's not bad no We'd be okay. Yeah, I mean, I we would mean, manage. I'd We'd be, be good fine in the wilderness. We've got... Exactly. Yeah, we can take care of ourselves in the wilderness. Mm-hmm. We can My... fight if we need to. We can make a d- delicious bread if we need to. <laughs> my my only question now is if we, with what our fighter ranks are, do we have anyone who can do healing? I've got healing at yeah. two, but it, it's better than nothing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Healing is one of the only skills I don't have at all. <laughs> yeah, I don't either. Yeah, I think I might so have that's... been the only one that took that. Yeah, that might be the only place that we'd actually have a little bit of a rough time is because we don't have, like, a very big fighter. Then we'd probably want a little bit... If you're going to have, More like, healing. medium fighter, you want medium healer. Yeah, <laughs> yeah for sure. <laughs> to balance it out. So if we had, like, one more person... Who did fighting. Mm-hmm. Or who did, yeah, either fighting or healing. I think we'd be perfectly set. Because really, we've rounded out every other thing. Because mm-hmm. we've got... Honestly, like, my character is the least helpful of all of them, probably. <laughs> Legitimately. Because all of my points are in, like, baking. Mm-hmm. You provide And then sustenance. all of my skill things are that I will give everything I have to, like, anyone I come across. So, like, I'm really just going to hold the team back, <laughs> if I'm being honest. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I can, like, make stuff. I have Weaver and Armorer and Smith. and Yeah, so, like, you'd be clutch for, like, the downtime bits. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But not and much And then else. that would help us when we're in the active, like, combat bits and things like that. 
I'd be decent in the downtime bits and for making friends with the people who were trying to help. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Making friends is important. <laughs> that is important. In this world of Mouse Guard. Well, like Charlotte and Ryan are like two very important character types. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we're going to be really, like, yeah. really leaning on them there. Uh-huh. Yeah. Carrying the weight for the group. <laughs> <laughs> but Amelia's, Amelia, I also think that like having a newbie is a really important thing in Mouse Guard. Because it never says that anyone has to be certain levels. They just say that like you need to have a leader mm-hmm. who can either be a captain or a patrol leader. Mm-hmm. But like it's such a different experience when you have a tender paw that the team is looking out for and you get to see them grow and... Like, Mm -hmm. if you get to the point where they finally get a cloak, it's like, hooray! (laughs) It's such a wholesome, like, watching a child grow in Mm -hmm. front of you. It's like the emotional glue of the group. Yeah. That's very cool. And because they're usually either the ones that are like, I'm really scared, and they get their courage, or they're really headstrong and like, I can do this, and they're like, you're going to get killed. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Child. (laughs) I thought that building characters was really interesting because it's not particularly balanced in the way that we think of traditional, quote unquote, traditional RPGs being balanced, where Mm -hmm. like everybody having kind of a similar starting point, like all starting at the same level or something like that, um, you can kind of pick whatever you want. And so I have fewer skills than other people. I have... You know, like little baby stats, uh, which I mean <laughs> makes sense for my character, and I like the idea that we can play this whole broad spectrum of um, experience levels. But it's interesting because I don't think it's a thing that a lot of games do, and I think that sometimes that could be um, a source of tension in some groups too, potentially because some people are way better at things than others, and that. Isn't, doesn't always go over well, you know. Mm-hmm. The nice thing is that dice are always there to knock you down. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. Or large snakes. Yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Either way. <laughs> yeah, take your pick. I want to talk, We've, you know, we kind of touched on this a little bit just a second ago, but I want to talk about character development and how the system allows you to develop as a character. And that's not necessarily like leveling up or something like that, but how do your characters change through the narrative of the game? We talked a little bit about the fact that, like, I don't have my cloak yet, and so eventually I'll get that, and that will be an exciting thing for me. Um, But what kind of other stuff can you do in this game, and, like, how does it sort of reinforce narrative play? Well, I think the main thing is uh, the belief and the instinct that a mouse has. Mm -hmm. Uh, Those can change and grow. So it's a situation where Suddenly, if you feel like your mouse has lost faith in their belief or they have a new belief, uh, Mm. you can change that. And I think that's kind of the simplest, most to the point way of enforcing a a narrative structure is that like, well, if it doesn't fit anymore, then change it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if you complete it, then you get extra bonuses and things like that Mm. at the end of the session which is really nice. It's a nice way to keep you on track of it. Mm -hmm. Um, As a gaming group, um, I'll also say there's an end of session bit where you choose like who is the MVP, Mm. who is the workhorse, things like that. Aww. It's really nice. (laughs) It's really nice. And it's... (laughs) This game is so wholesome. (laughs) Yeah. It's kind of a way that you get like, you might get like a little competitive, but it's also, for the most part, it's just a moment where you're just like, that moment, I started crying. You're so incredible. Oh, my God. <laughs> and, like, it's really good. It, it's kind of rough if you're like, Ugh, I didn't get anything for two sessions in a row. Mm. But usually it's pretty easy to be like, duh, but everyone else deserved it so much more. <laughs> right. <laughs> Plus, there's a lot of options, too. It's not just the MVP. They have different uh, awards, I guess, you can get at the end. So if you have a small group, Maybe there's enough for one for everyone each time. <laughs> yeah. Um, one other thing I would say for in-character growth is the downtime bits, um, which I think is the PC turn or is it the GM turn? 
I it's been too long since I've played. I can't remember <laughs> whichever one it is, where you like recoup and research and things like that. It solidifies and tears apart friendships be- between the mice <laughs> so quickly, because I remember the first game I played. Um, there was the healer, and my character was like hot headed, constantly running into fights etc and constantly rolled horribly so i always needed healing i always was losing all of my mouse nature i was struggling really badly so all the downtimes would always be like how many people can i convince to help me (laughs) because you can spend your turn trying to ease something from someone else if you're going if you're fine or if you're just going to deal with your hurts so on, there would be days where the healer would be like, I think her name is Marceline because I'm one of those kids. Uh, <laughs> it'd be like, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to use my turn to help heal you, and I'd be like, You're an angel. You're the most amazing person. I couldn't live without you, etc. Next week they want to heal the kid, the tender paw that they're mentoring, and I'm like, I'm gonna throw you off a tree someday. <laughs> You mean nothing. This is garbage. I'm going to go, like, punch a rock and hurt myself even worse. And there were bad days. And so I'd constantly had, like, a sliding scale of how I felt about all my teammates because you have to decide what you're going, who you're going to interact with, who you're going to help, and really what matters most to you in those moments, which really builds or destroys <laughs> relationships. <laughs> yeah. That's interesting. I just talked a lot. Well, no, that's why <laughs> I lost my spot in the outline. I was like, where were It was we? a good story. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we are going to go ahead and get into our advancement discussion and take it up a level. Take it up a level. Take it up a level. In this segment, we will cover how character advancement or leveling up is covered in the system. So how does character how, how do characters level up in mouse guard and what sort of perks are we looking at when that happens you level up by failing a bunch oh yeah it's so or, i love systems I think also like this. by succeeding also right? by succeeding yeah. failing and succeeding oh um but it's not so much a leveling up process as when you uh, after you pass a roll a certain amount of times and fail that roll a certain amount of times you get another uh, advancement in that skill Oh, So basically the only way you can gain levels is just by doing it. Yeah. So it's Do pretty it. realistic again. It's yeah. another thing that they've kind of taught that like the only way you get better at something is by doing it. You're not just going to magically, oh, 10 days have passed and now I'm great at woodworking. Like, <laughs> no, that's not how that works. But that's a you... huge frustration of mine, too. It's like, <laughs> wait, where did this skill come from? Why do I yeah. know parasailing? I don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so like if you're going to do woodworking 12 times you're gonna get better Mm -hmm. even if you botch all of the little things you're trying to whittle like you've learned what not to do right (laughs) exactly Mm -hmm. yeah and i'd love that i love that mechanic in every game it's in i love progressing from failure i also like progressing from success i just like progressing with meaning (laughs) and mouse guard has both of those things it's great The only time it can be a little frustrating if you're like, all right, I've got five passes and two fails. I need one more fail to advance this. Uh, And now I'm just not failing any of my rolls, which is not a bad (laughs) problem to have. But it can be a little frustrating when you're just that close to your next advancement. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting. Yeah, you can see on the character sheet, there's a little PF next to all the skills. Yeah, I was wondering what that was for. (laughs) You can count how many times you've passed and failed. Yeah, that makes sense, because I was wondering how you keep track of that, because I know there are other systems, too, where, like, you get, you know, kind of XP based on having used your skills, and um, keeping track of that can be really obnoxious, let's say. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so it's nice to to have that right on the sheet, that you can just fill in little bubbles. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, so what it is, is you have to um, get whatever your rating is in that skill, you need to pass it that many times and fail it that many times to minus one. Oh. Okay. So it also gets a little, takes a little more the better you are at the skill, which also makes sense, because the more you know, 
the mo- longer it's going to take for you to learn more advanced things. Mm-hmm. Right. And once you get to six in a skill, then then you're done, right? Yeah. I believe so. Five? Yeah. No, six is the top. Oh, that's right. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. And I see that you can actually, you can increase your abilities and stuff through the same method. Like will, health, so. resources, and circles. It's on the character sheet, so I'm going to say yes. It's on the character sheet. It has to be <laughs> true. Yeah, I think I know it's actually the exact nature, same way. Which yeah. is a funky one. That's really I wanted cool. to double check. <laughs> and the same for um, wises. your wises and things like that. Like, you can improve in just about everything. Hmm. Which is nice, because I think that there are some games, too, where it's like, oh, better take this during character creation, because otherwise you're out of luck. Mm -hmm. Not getting it. Yeah, I like that a lot. You also have the opportunity to, like, add wises and things like that, add other traits, which is nice, as they become more relevant to your character. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, well, it makes sense for me to work on this and go into this. Mm -hmm. Can you, like, train skills during downtime? mouse guard i'm trying to remember um well because there are some skills that really only work during downtime Mm. like weaving yeah (laughs) (laughs) so what you just do i think is in your one part of the session you'd be like i'm weaving it'd be like okay make a roll (laughs) (laughs) yeah (laughs) so it's not for weaving between enemies Not quite. Uh, That's the same concept, I don't concept, know if you can sell it though. to a GM. I clearly GM. learned how to... No. <laughs> <laughs> Just make it I'm a little bit I'm great going smaller. in and out of things. There you go. <laughs> so do you think it's beneficial to have your character advancement in mind to kind of know where you want to go? Or do you think it's better to just, like, let it happen over the course of the game? You got to let it happen. Yeah. I. It's always really uncomfortable for me when people are like... Oh, I'm so close to that weather watcher skill. I'm going to look at the weather again. It's like, okay, well, you're fighting a toad. (laughs) Are you really going to be looking at the weather right now? And they're like, well, and I'm like, stop, stop pushing it. Just fight the toad. You can watch weather later. (laughs) If it happens, it happens. It's going to happen eventually. Mm -hmm. Just let it make sense. (laughs) Yeah. Well, I think especially because it depends on using those skills, too. You can't plan out what skills you're going to use. It's going to depend on the story and what right. other people do and what roles they pass or fail, too. Mm-hmm. So you can't yeah. really dictate ahead of time what those things are. And I think because you're not within a class necessarily, um, you know, it's not like every five levels you get, like, the new thing for your class because everybody's a little mouse. And so, you know, there's not really a reason to, like, keep track of, you know, pretty soon I can get this when I get to the next level. It's like, oh, you know, hey, look, now I'm really good at being a scout or now I'm extra good at weaving. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, like, if you – I think it's a really good mechanical system – for making sure that everyone's doing things. Mm-hmm. Because especially if you're at a table where you communicate and you talk about how close you are to advancements and things, people can be like, oh, oh, well, I typically scout, but, like, you're so close to leveling up and scout. I Before I talk, like, step up. Like, I'm going to let you do it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you can have kind of those out-of-game conversations to kind of collaborate yeah. and help people, too. Yeah. Yeah, Mouse Guard is very in-game and out-of-game about the journey more so the destination. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, And being able to organically find that, oh, suddenly I am better at this one skill that I didn't necessarily take a character creation, wasn't interested in at first, uh, and then ended up using a lot. And I think it's really interesting to see where your character goes from there. Yeah, it seems like there's a lot of opportunity to kind of... Um, there's a lot of opportunity for character development and to kind of like watch your little, your little person grow into something that maybe you didn't expect at the beginning. This doesn't Mm. seem like the kind of game where you can go in and say, this is the character arc. You know, this is the story I want to tell with this character. Mm -hmm. It seems a lot more, um, a lot more fitted to saying, here's where I am now. And I'm excited to see where I go on this journey. Mm -hmm. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's funny because uh, being the only healer in the group, 
it's like I I didn't set out to be the healer, but I can see this character being quote unquote the healer after a while. Just I think of... yeah, you'd get levels in it pretty quick. Yeah. I think. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, the thing is, because anyone could try healing as well, Okay. because in skills that you don't have any points, you still have beginner's luck oh. as just something that you can do, which I think relies on either your will or your health, mm-hmm. and then bonuses. So, because they, they want you to grow, and like if you're part of the mouse guard, they want everyone to know a bit of everything. Mm-hmm. So right. if someone's in game teaching you if you see someone healing you're like oh, i want to try healing you can try it is that how you get new new skills then yep oh cool yeah you, you just go i want to weather watch today and it's like yeah. all right you failed <laughs> roll Mark some d6 failure now oh nice yeah. yeah long story short i love this game <laughs> well megan and charlotte thank you so much for joining us to talk about mouse guard character creation with us can you remind everyone where they can find you and what sorts of things you're working on? How about you go first, Megan? Yeah, I was like, oh, shoot, who was supposed to go first? <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't on the right page. It doesn't matter. Again, I'm Megan. I don't know why I waved. I'm so used to... <laughs> Hello. <laughs> you can find me on Twitter and Instagram at tabletop underscore Megan, and you can listen to me every Monday or really whenever you want because it's on pod catchers at tabletop potluck very cool charlotte uh you can find me on twitter at the corn breb with a b and you can also hear me on tabletop potluck every monday or also whenever you want to listen to it (laughs) who are you to tell me when i can listen to your podcast (laughs) (laughs) well thank you both so much for sitting down with us this was a lot of fun and i love our cute little mouse people they're so cute me too i love them so much um and thank you to everyone for tuning in character creation cast is a production of the one shot podcast network and can be found online at www.charactercreationcast.com. Head to the website to get more information on our hosts and guests, or even find some of our character sheets. Character Creation Cast can be found on Twitter, at CreationCast. I'm one of your hosts, Amelia Antrim, and I can be found on Twitter, at Ginger Reckoning. Our other host, Ryan Bolter, can be found on Twitter, at Lord Neptune. Music for this episode is used with a Creative Commons license, or with permission from the podcast it originated from. Further information can be found within the show notes. Our main theme music is Hero Remix by Steve Combs and is used with a Creative Commons license. This podcast is owned by us under Creative Commons. This episode was edited by Amelia Antrim. Further information for the game system used and today's guests can also be found in the show notes. If you like the game systems discussed and wish to purchase them, Links to the products can be found in the show notes. Also check our notes or the website for cool stuff to go with each character, like dice or mixtapes. Thanks for joining us. And remember, we find that the best part of any role-playing game is character creation. So go out there and create some amazing people. We'll see you next time. Gotta read some show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Character Creation Cast is hosted by the One Shot Podcast Network. If you enjoyed our show, visit OneShotPodcast.com, where you'll find other great shows like Adventure. Adventure is an actual play podcast that focuses on the fun of fan fiction and is set in your favorite fictional universes. Join host Pranks Paul as he takes a variety of guests through self-contained stories featuring Harry Potter, Pokemon, Animorphs, and other favorites. Ah, you guys, I switched the tab and now I can't get back to the right one. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) It's okay. I'm just going to keep thinking Mouse Guard's really cute. I mean, it is. It It is. is. Correct. (laughs) You're correct. (laughs) Ryan, we're going to have to fix this because we can't say let's make some people. Why? (laughs) Let's make some mice.
Oh yeah, let's make some mice. Mice, I mean, are, mice are people too. too right? Mice are people too. <laughs> All yes, sentient we don't say creatures humans. are people too. That's right. Non-human That's persons. Right. I do let's believe we established that little, in our creatures. yes early on in our show. We did establish <laughs> yeah. everyone is uh-huh. people. Everyone is people. <laughs> everyone is people. <laughs> uh-huh. Well, hold on now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you're right. Nazis, well. not people. <laughs> hot take um i want to do a quick tangent feel free to cut it if you want (laughs) um marquez who's also on tabletop potluck the first time that when i started playing mouse guard when we were in college he i i learned it from a friend of ours who was australian and so he was telling marquez about mouse guard and he said law mouse but he has an Australian ac- or a lore mouse, but he has an Australian accent, so it sounded like law mouse. <laughs> and Marquez was like, "Do they get to wear a wig?" <laughs> and uh, our friend was like, uh, "If they want to," and he just had no idea I mean, I why he'd no say that. Rule against it, but uh-huh. that's I mean, a- and then Marquez-, yeah. Marquez was very sad when he found out he didn't get a gavel or anything. <laughs> oh. I want to be a law mouse, though. There is law um. Mouse. There is a skill that's like that, where it's like you're administrator. That's kind of yeah. like that. I was, I was thinking sheriff when you said law mouse. <laughs> oh. I am the law mouse around here. <laughs> I like that I pronounce it two different ways, depending on which sentence I'm saying it in, because I can't decide how I want to pronounce it. Orator. 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 If you say it Orator. enough, it sounds like nothing, so... <laughs> Orator. I think it's good to just get all the options out there and then know that at least somewhere in there you were correct. Uh-huh. Exactly. <laughs> and I realize that's not a good microphone sound. <laughs> <laughs> oh, bless you. Bless you. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Gesundheit. <laughs> Speaking of recipe-wise, since Mouse Guard is like a fairly popular role-playing game, even though it's not in a lot of actual play podcasts, it's got a really strong following, mm-hmm. and people love the comics. There are you can find like recipes online for oh, little mouse recipes. Food, yeah. yes. Aww. Indeed, we at Tabletop Potluck, uh, one of our uh, performers made Gab Croon, which is a specialty bread from Lock Haven. Oh, which nice! Is like a seedy nut bread, and it was very good. Was it? Yeah, was it, it was. teeny tiny or <laughs> <laughs> teeny tiny bread? <laughs> which is a weird thing to say. That is a weird word. There's a lot of W's going on here. Why is weasels weir- weird? Weasel wise, 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 wise. Wise. Word. Why? Why is wise is weird to say? <laughs> <laughs> There's a dog moaning outside my door. <laughs> I won't let her in. Oh, poor puppy. Can't Ew. come in. There's mice in here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, let's see. Oh yeah, we're doing a podcast. Yeah. Right. I know. So, um, 